Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, industry panel discussion uh, hosted by Geo Institute on the topic of building brands uh, in the digital age. So for today's session, uh, we have an interesting mix of panelists. Uh, we have uh, uh, veteran leaders from the digital media agency side who have uh, traversed the journey from being predominantly physical to now predominantly digital, who have helped uh, multiple brands over the years um, achieve their uh, marketing objectives. And we also have uh, uh, someone from the uh, brand side who actually kind of sets the brand objectives from the company or the organization side. So uh, the people are, we have um, uh, Ms. Anusha Shetty, who is the chairperson and uh, MD for uh, Gray Group in India. We have uh, Ms. Kavita Lakhani, who is uh, director of operations for uh, Weber Shandwick in India. And we have uh, Ms. Shefali Khalsa, who heads uh, brands and uh, communication and CSR uh, with State Bank of India's uh, general insurance uh, business. Uh, but before we go into the uh, panel discussion, uh, I would also like to quickly uh, invite and introduce Dr. Frank Mulhan, who is one of our academic mentors at Geo Institute. Uh, Dr. Frank is an associate dean uh, for research and executive uh, director of academic programs in the San Francisco campus of uh, Middle School uh, of Northwestern University. So Dr. Frank, I would uh, request you to provide a few opening notes uh, or comments on the topic that we have at hand. Yes. So good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a very excellent uh, group of panelists. Uh, the topic's gonna be themed around brands, brand communications and brand management. Uh, our Geo Institute program we're about to launch in digital media and marketing communications, which is one of two programs. The other one is in artificial intelligence and data science. Uh, the program we're going to launch in digital media is very focused on brands, consumers, media, technologies, data, and analytics. And really very much at the heart of it is, is the relationship between consumers and brands. And I think we're going to hear a lot from our panelists tonight about that particular thing and about the changing role of brands in the digital world that we now live in. There's a, a legacy system of brand strategy and brand communications and brand management that comes out of a pre-digital age that has been evolving for quite a bit of time to become digital first. And that, uh, as you'll hear tonight, is, is a very prominent thing in the nature of managing brands and communicating with brands and building and maintaining relationships with consumers around, again, that core brand slash consumer relationship. So I'm very excited to be here. I think we're going to hear some terrific input. Uh, it's an ever-changing world. So uh, we also will hear themes, of, themes about how organizations are adapting and changing the way they build their brands and manage the relationships with consumers. And uh, the other piece of it, which we will not get into in much detail tonight, but there's, there's also a parallel kind of data, analytics, measurement, financial outcomes aspect to brands that I'm sure some of our panelists will touch on that is very much at the heart of this evolving world. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, welcome everyone and thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so before we dive into the uh, panel discussion, uh, I thought as a host, uh, uh, let me take a couple of quick minutes to uh, just uh, provide you a snapshot of what Geo Institute is all about. Uh, so the GEO Institute is being set up as an um, interdisciplinary uh, research-driven institute of higher education uh, under the aegis of Reliance Foundation as a not-for-profit initiative. Uh, and, and, and the motive behind uh, us uh, looking at this venture is that uh, uh, we feel that in India, we could have more ecosystems and institutions uh, which drive excellence in the research-driven education front, uh, uh, providing output and innovation that percolates down to society uh, and industry at large. So uh, that's the objective that we have uh, set for ourselves. We want to be an exemplary Indian academic institution, which can be over the years compared with the best in the world. Uh, and we are putting in place uh, all the building blocks for that. 
uh, we want to uh, develop an ecosystem in the country for research, innovation, and entrepreneurship, which uh, then produces our next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs through a holistic development uh, system. Uh, structurally, we have a uh, governing council, uh, which has uh, the Reliance family members and uh, uh, many other uh, academicians and industry leaders, uh, as you can see. Uh, we are headed by our chancellor, Dr. R. A. Marshalpa, who is an eminent scientist. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of London, Padma Bibhushan Awardee. And our vice chancellor is Dr. Deepak Jain, who is a, a former dean uh, at Kellogg School of Management, US and uh, INSEAD Paris. Uh, then uh, given our goal of uh, being able to compare and benchmark against the best in the world, we also have a global advisory council of four very distinguished institution builders from uh, very distinguished uh, places, uh, the names which you can actually see on your screen right now. Uh, and finally, we have a panel of academic advisors who are helping us develop the program. So Dr. Frank is here with us. He is helping us develop a one-year full-time residential uh, PGP program on digital media and marketing communication. Similarly, there is one more program on uh, AI and data science uh, of the same structure, one-year full-time. That's being developed by Dr. Larry uh, Bonbon from uh, Northwestern University and Dr. Shailesh Kumar, who is the chief data scientist in uh, GEO. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Mohan Chalappa from John Hopkins in the US, who is helping us develop a program on public health management. And Dr. Sutton, who is helping us develop a program on sports management, which is an up and coming field in India. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Keller, the, uh, the chief uh, librarian at Stanford University, who is helping us develop our library system. So uh, what do we want to, where do we see ourselves in 15 years? So we see ourselves as an interdisciplinary, resource-driven, full-fledged university with multiple schools under it, offering courses from undergrad to postgrad to uh, doctoral to PhD, uh, along uh, mainstreams like engineering, medical sciences, uh, management, arts and humanities, law, uh, governance, etc. We see ourselves uh, stabilizing at about 10,000 students in the long run uh, with an educate uh, and corresponding number of faculty as well. And uh, really in the long run, we want to be uh, able to be in the same space as some of the leading universities in the world. The 15 years that I talked about is kind of uh, internally, we have uh, divided it into three phases. In the first phase, which we call the startup phase, uh, we are going to launch uh, postgraduate programs and PhD and postdoc programs uh, along different streams, some of which I just mentioned. Uh, once we have done that and we have built up uh, our equity in research and education, in the growth phase, we will expand it to undergrad programs in the next five years uh, along various disciplines. And then finally, in the third phase of five years, we will kind of uh, finish the agenda that we had in terms of our overall vision. So that's where we are. We are uh, currently we have a campus which is almost ready uh, to welcome students uh, at Ulwe, which is in Navi, Mumbai. I'll just quickly uh, leave you with uh, some of the pictures uh, uh, from the campus uh, to get your feel, and then we will uh, dive in straight into the into the uh, panel discussion. So this is in fact where we are sitting. I am sitting right now um, in Navi, Mumbai. Uh, our uh, so our plan is to kind of commence classes from middle of this year so stay tuned for uh, more information and updates uh, around uh, announcements around that as well so yeah so that's where uh, i'll probably end the presentation part and let's just uh, get into the uh, actual uh, heart of the matter, uh, which is uh, the session for today. Uh, so for that, uh, let me start off with, uh, with a hypothetical question to Anusha. Um, Anusha, uh, let's assume uh, 2007, 15 years back from now, uh, we are old enough to know that maybe many in the audience may not, BlackBerry used to be a huge brand in mobile phones, uh, re-aspirational as well. 
Assume in 2007, BlackBerry wants to launch something which is slightly different from what they have been doing. Let's say a touchscreen phone uh, compared to, as opposed to the famous QWERTY keyboards that they had. Contrast that 15 years later at this point of time. And let's assume that Samsung wants to launch, launch a, a smartphone, a smart watch. How would you have advised and helped uh, BlackBerry do that in 2007? And how would you do it now? And what has essentially changed? Uh, you're on mute, Anusha. Sorry. Thanks, Utanka. Uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, question out there. Uh, just to introduce myself a little better, even before I start talking, I, I was an advertising professional in 2007. Uh, right. So I, I used to work with, uh, uh, you know, I started my career way back in 1994, uh, worked with multiple agencies before I jumped into digital marketing. And uh, uh, now I do integrated marketing for both digital and mainland. So, you know, I really knew how life was in 2007. Uh, so it's not something that I need to imagine and talk. I was a marketer. I was an advertising professional at that point of time. And I knew exactly how a marketer thought in 2007. Let me kind of paint this picture for all of you. Digital marketing was really, really fresh and new at that point of time. Uh, we had a very, uh, you know, there was one primary social media platform called Orkut. That's where people went to. And India was probably the last to join this whole uh, social media marketing uh, wave, really, or social media wave itself, right? There was only Orkut at that time. Facebook was just beginning to make noise. Orkut it was. I remember I had my first account in Orkut in 2007, right? Uh, and what were marketeers like those days? Marketeers believed digital was a complete bubble. People were crazy. This is a bubble. It's going to burst and it's going to be over. People are just unnecessarily obsessing about something called digital. And this is really what they were talking about those days, really. Yeah. So for a marketeer in 2007, if anybody had to launch something like a touchscreen, Blackberry, whatever feature, it really doesn't matter. Any brand that was worth uh, its budget, right? If there was a brand big enough to have a nice, decent budget, there was no question but TVC as the primary way to communicate to the uh, end consumer. Monies went primarily into a TV commercial, followed by print and outdoor and maybe some into radio. That was the media plan and that's how it looked. And we called it the 360 degree media uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attack, uh, PR would play a big role. And that's really where life was. So if we had launched BlackBerry, if I had to play a role in 2007, trying to do something like this, it would have looked exactly the same. It's a different point that I had gotten into digital marketing in 2005. So I was an early believer in digital marketing. I was going, I was talking to clients about digital marketing, but people just dismissed me. At that point of time, it was like, what is digital? This is a bubble. This is not real. It's going to burst. And so that's really what life would have been in 2007. Now let's take and fast forward life to today. What life looks like today, right? Um, uh, I'll, I'll draw some numbers out for you. You know, the size of this whole internet digital industry in India is around... Uh, 925 million people on the internet. That's what India is like. Now let's look at the TV industry, right? There are 160 million households with TV. And let's assume four people per household watching TV. If you switched on all the TVs in India, you would still get only 780 million people on TV. And the size of the Indian internet industry stands at 925 million people on the internet today, right? So we're talking about uh, a very, very different phase in life. Does that mean that if smart, you know, you know, it's a different point. Samsung is a brand that we shouldn't talk about because Samsung is quite digitally savvy and they do quite a bit of the internet. But even today, friends, I must tell you that even though the size of the internet is 925 million people on the internet and, and TV is only 780 million people on, on TV, even today, marketeers are very, very restless when it comes to digital. It is obvious digital is exploding, it's growing, the kind of spends on digital is there, but even today a marketer feels extremely uncomfortable on digital. He or she still prefers uh, uh, TV, right? Because that's a comfort industry for marketers who are already in their 50s 
who've seen that world, who have grown into CMO positions, are very comfortable with the TV industry. But life is different today. Like I said, if 925 million people are sitting on the internet, obviously this is a place where the consumer is and therefore marketeers need to be here. So today, if I had to go back and recommend uh, a, a plan, then I would do digital first. I would also do TV, by the way. I will not write TV at this point of time. Brand had large enough budgets, and we're talking Samsung, which has large enough budgets. Then I would definitely do digital first, followed by TV, and maybe a little bit of education on print, and of course PR as required. So that's broadly what the landscape will look like today. But if you take a smaller brand, if it's not Samsung, let's say a known brand launching a smartwatch, not too much budget, right? Then I would just do digital first and do nothing else because there's no reason. Nine twenty-five million people, you cannot, it can't get more massier than that on digital. And that's the size of the internet today. So I hope I answered your questions. You did. Then fascinating numbers, actually, what you told about the maximum possible in television versus what is there in the... And I think that gap is going to only widen, right? And thanks to Geo, this really has widened, right? The explosion happened in the last two, three years because of Geo, honestly. True, true. true. A very interesting point. Uh, so I want to move to Shefali uh, with uh, picking up the thread from there. But uh, just before that, uh, audience, uh, you can put in your questions in the uh, in the chat or the Q and A uh, box, and we will uh, answer those questions in a in a while from now. So feel free to type in. We will keep looking and keep answering as we go along at the uh, at a later point of time. So uh, bring in uh, Shefali here, and Shefali, you could perhaps also do a quick intro of what you have been doing. Uh, and then I want you to answer this question. How do you, uh, what changes have you seen in the way, given this transition in terms of where consumers are? Uh, Anusha just mentioned the numbers on TV versus internet. What changes have you seen in terms of consumer behavior in the way they interact with brands today versus they would have done, let's say, 10 years back even? Um, so I'm Shifari Khalsa. I head the brand and uh, corporate communication and CSR with uh, uh, State Bank of uh, India's uh, general insurance uh, company, which is SBI General Insurance. And um, very glad to take this question. Uh, in fact, it's a very interesting question. Um, so the, there has been a substantial shift in the consumer behavior, uh, in not just in decade, I would say, relative comparison could also be pre-COVID and now. You know, of course, uh, as Anusha mentioned, there is a digital spike and digital involvement in everything today. Uh, even I am an advocate of digital marketing for sure, Anusha. Um, and uh, just to add to this, I would say, I mean, of course, today's consumer is much evolved and is tech savvy. You know, and um, I would say the journey has been from paper to paperless, from click on a uh, computer to tap on a mobile. You know, that's the journey that we have seen so far. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I, I always give this credit uh, of this evolved customer to the e-commerce digitization, because with that, today the consumer knows um, how technology works, the gamifications. Uh, today, the consumer wants DIY, you know. In fact, the prominent uh, behavior that we are seeing today uh, from the consumer perspective is they, they want to be more digitally connected. So today's consumer is very well digitally connected with the brand and vice versa, I would say. And the second point is also they, they expect a very quick turnaround time. So they are very impatient now with so much around. And of course, there's too much of content around to explain everything today. And that, that's also, uh, you know, reciprocating the, the need of the consumer today. Um, and, uh, you know, as the consumer today has evolved. I would like to cite one example. We all would have been privy to the, you know, uh, those uh, consumerforum.com uh, sites, mouthshut.com sites. We would have heard and we would have, uh, in fact, uh, in my brand, I have worked to manage the ORM, which is online reputation management. So those were the days about, days about a decade back where the consumer used to put across their complaints and the brands used to create their account to pacify these customers, uh, respond to that, uh, those complaints, etc. All of that has moved today to social media. So social media, uh, in a way, is one uh, important touch point, the way consumer wants to be contacted, connected, and is the way uh, they also connect with the brand. You know, so uh, that social media is one of the, you know, uh, that important platform out of that, this whole uh, you know, ecosystem of the digital that we are into. 
So uh, yeah, largely I would say this is the uh, largely the behavioral change that I'm seeing. No, this is interesting. So uh, yeah, so digital was there 10 years back, but the movement from these uh, online uh, review platforms uh, to that function entirely shifting to show social media, right? So quite interesting. Uh, Right. And you also mentioned another thing. Uh, we need not look at 10 years. There has been something going on in the last two, three years pre and post COVID. So on that cue, in fact, uh, for our audience, I would like to just put up a quick uh, question where you can just uh, click on your answer. Uh, and it is related to that. Uh, so what has uh, changed uh, in terms of uh, post-COVID or post-pandemic uh, world. So just a second, the question will uh, come up right now on your screen. Yeah. So what is the most important thing for an organization now, post-pandemic? So if you can say or vote, what do you think uh, within the next 10 seconds? Let's see what, uh, what our audience thinks about it. And then uh, Kavita, I'll come to you. All right, so uh, a large percentage, around one third each believe that building brand awareness is one third believe that is the most important. Another one third says differentiating the brand from the competition. Interestingly, uh, and, and then followed by taking a position on social issues, one fourth. Very few people think that selling products and services is what the organization is doing. Very interesting kind of uh, observations. Uh, Quite interesting. So people don't think that uh, digitally you're actually doing it to sell. Selling then becomes kind of the final byproduct uh, out of the activities, brand building and uh, competition, uh, fence guarding that you do. Uh, so now let me just come to Kavita uh, on something which is perhaps not so, uh, not changing in that rapid a pace. So even when we are in the flux of this great internet revolution, digital social revolution on one side and AI coming into the play as well, uh, what are some of the core uh, attributes of brand building, Kavita? And uh, please also do uh, kindly introduce a little bit about yourself because you have a rich history uh, like both the other panelists as well. Uh, what are some of the core attributes of brand building that has continued to remain unchanged even as we are going through this great technological churn? Uh, you know, Utanka, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having us on this panel discussion. Uh, it's an it's a very interesting subject, and I uh, I truly believe that you know a lot of people in the audience uh, you know have a lot to contribute, and I could see that from the poll that you just conducted. Uh, but just to tell you a little about myself, I look at brands as a customer would. I don't have any communication background at all. I'm completely an industry practitioner, and I've learned. Uh, you know, whatever knowledge that I have on brands, on consulting for brands, has come simply through my experiences, uh, simply through working with brands uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, specifics of what I've been doing through my career available on LinkedIn, so I'm not going to bore you with the details. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I'm going to come back to the question that you asked, you know, what is the core or what are the core attributes of brand building? And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that you've asked it because uh, truly, you know, I, I feel that every brand, you know, has a story to tell. And as communicators, as marketeers, that's our role. We have to help brands tell their story. And why do we need to do that? Very simply because a human brain, you know, is wired to kind of, uh, you know, uh, respond to a well-defined narrative, a well-crafted narrative. And that's why we come into the picture. Uh, we also work very closely with brands to identify how can they capture the mind space. You know, so we talked about, you know, in the poll, there was a question about, you know, what is most important in the post-COVID era? It's all about brand awareness. 
and the other point was you know about how do you stay in their hearts how do you, how do you actually stay in the memories of uh, customers how do you become their preferred brand you know so i think that's where a brand story a powerful brand story really comes in the picture and if i have to zero in on just one attribute of brand building it would be that it would be about building a powerful brand story and no matter you know what the technology advances are no matter how competitive or hyper competitive the market space is you know or or no matter what what the situation is whether it's a covid tomorrow there's something else a powerful brand story will actually help the brand to stand out stand out in a cluttered market stand out in a market which is kind of evolving all the time so the good news here is that a brand story actually is in the control of the brand and its communication partners and that's the only thing that we control that's the beauty of it all you know uh, other attributes you know whether it's the brand identity the brand design the logo you know platforms channels how do we use all of them come much later the technology that you use you know the uh, retail channels how do you really use all of these to touch your customers or to uh, you know if you know what i mean engage with your customers they come much much later so for me this is a single most important that so if i could probably paraphrase you and correct me if i'm wrong what you're saying is uh, how we reach the person and uh, when we reach the person where we reach the customer can change with changes in technology but what we are telling the person at the core remains the same and that has remained the same can i also uh, actually give you two or three examples you now i can actually spend the night talking about this but you know there are a couple of brands that are really close to my heart you know so for example apple uh, you know when steve jobs started looking at the uh, you know at the gadget that he created through the lens of a story you know suddenly he really thought about the customer the customer is a hero in this story so who is he creating this product for this is for a customer who is a creative individual who likes to think think differently so really that was the brand story that apple has kind of put out there or starbucks you know i've worked on the starbucks brand for many many years and it's very dear to my heart and i'm also a very uh, loyal starbucks customer so you know we in india or in the us we used to so if you were in the us you were buying coffee for 3 to 4 cents but what did starbucks do they really elevated coffee uh, and and really exploded the market by not just offering a customer a cup of coffee or what they did was really gave them a comfortable sophisticated and uh, you know i would say relaxing environment in the midst of a very speedy lifestyle a very fast paced lifestyle so they came up with this concept of the third place the first place is our home the second place is our work environment our office in when we were in the uh, physical world so and the third place is where you forge bonds you relax you're in an amiable environment so that was really the concept that starbucks worked on or you know if i have to come closer back closer home in the indian environment raw pressery it's a startup brand it was born in india so how did it how was it born anuj rakia and this is another brand that i worked on so i know the brand story really well so anuj rakia and the founder was unwell and he was looking in the market for uh, juices which were preservative free and he could not find any because there were none and so what he did so raw pressery was born in his kitchen because he really came up with the recipes for the raw pressery brand he experimented with vegetables and fruits uh, bootstrapped the venture uh, after a year and a half uh, sequoia came in and you know the raw pressery brand so authentic brand stories are really the starting point the foundation block for building a powerful brand everything else comes much later so uh, i just like to end there no thanks kavita actually uh, the, those examples uh, help us understand much better in real terms what you actually meant yeah thanks for that let me now kind of turn around and look at this whole phenomena from a from a 
from our audience point of view, many of the people in our audience would be young professionals uh, who would have started their careers uh, in the last few years. So if you take a, and this is a question where all of you can come in as you please, uh, not to anyone in specific. So if you take a 25 year old professional who has probably two, three years of experience doing different sorts of customer facing roles. It could be account management, it could be marketing, digital or physical, uh, or any other uh, customer engaging roles. Uh, and this person wants to get into the field of digital marketing uh, uh, as a career option. So what are the skills that he would need to acquire to be a successful professional for the, in the next five to 10 year horizon? You know, uh, What are some of the things that she should look at uh, kind of acquiring? Nice. Should I take that? Yeah, please. I think actually, you know, I may actually overlap with Kavita and I'm glad you asked this question right after Kavita. Uh, and I'll try and overlap the answer a little bit uh, to make that more seamless. Uh, you know, um, uh, a professional, a student, a young uh, a professional looking at digital marketing as, a, as an area uh, for their growth uh, for a career, um, you know, there are some obvious things, but even before those obvious things, the first point I want to make here is that digital marketing is a set of new media touch points. There are new media touch points available for a marketer today to be able to get their brand to use those media touch points to communicate with the consumer. The principles of brand building haven't changed. The principles of brand building haven't changed at all. A brand is a brand. And like what Kavita was saying, it's very, very important to have the right positioning, the right value proposition of the brand, right? So the principles of brand building remains the same and there is sufficient amount of knowledge uh, in our system about, about brands and how brands are built. One needs to know this. Now, if you don't know this as a foundation, trying to learn digital marketing gets extremely tactical in nature. One of the biggest challenges our entire industry faces is that a lot of marketers look down on the digital market industry as a set of young people who don't understand brand building, who are out there to do some tactical things. Now, this is what we need to change as an image of our industry, right? We need to talk the language of brands. We need to talk about how brands are built and what one needs to do. Where is the problem today? What does the brand need? How can we create a solution for this brand? That's the first foundation of any brand work. Now, I can make a choice after that to say that, you know, I will execute this entire thinking behind the brand and take this knowledge and communication to an end consumer using digital. Digital is an execution platform for us, right? There are many options within digital and I can use all of them to go and connect to the consumer. Now, three things, you know, so three things very important in digital and I must talk about content is obviously extremely important. Content is king and this is a phrase we've all heard. Extremely important because the consumer on the internet is consuming so much of content that if you don't create and deliver content that is interest this consumer, then you know, it doesn't make sense at all. The second thing is data. There is data has always been important to our industry, you know, whether it's advertising or, you know, whether it's uh, marketing, research has always played a role and research was the way that we got our hands on data in the past. But today, data is available in plenty. It is available in the digital space. Every conversation we have is a data point for a marketer, right? For a brand. My suggestion, friends, get friendly with numbers. I hear a lot of marketeers, I hear a lot of brand professionals in my industry who claim that data or numbers is boring. They don't like numbers. Make friends with numbers. These are going to be your best friends. You need to be able to look at numbers and convert these numbers into insights and stories. Now, that's the second most important thing. And third most important thing is technology. We're obviously talking about a world with technology. And if you're able to bring technology and marry them into ideas, uh, you've created something extremely effective and, uh, and you know, impactful. So to summarize what I'm saying is, there is no replacement to the foundation of brand building, which is you have the principles of brand building remain safe. You need to learn that. Now layer this 
with great content, great data, uh, and great technology-related uh, uh, learning and knowledge, and you will be a star. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, uh, if I may add to what uh, Anusha said, you know, I, I just want to say that you know, with two to three years, you know, typically, uh, I actually when I'm recruiting, I don't look for functional skill sets. Uh, and in fact, when I recruit, I look for attitude more than aptitude, you know. So the soft skills, you know, curiosity, uh, logical reasoning, you know, uh, also the uh, GQ, you know, how much are you following trends, you know, coherent uh, thinking, and most importantly, storytelling, you know, because the rest, rest of it can be taught, you know, and typically most people have, most students or most professionals, young people young professionals have an inclination uh, in one area or the other, you know, which Anusha talked about, either content in terms of uh, data or technology, they normally have it. So, you know, the rest can be taught, but I think the soft skills are, I would say, in this day and age, they are very, very important, as important as your functional skills. And if somebody is coming completely out of the, uh, hasn't really had experience in digital, uh, there's not much expected on the functional skills area. I think more importantly, if they're following the trends and they're learning a lot along, trust me, all of us are. So they are uh, they're just kind of jumping on the bandwagon and this is the right time for them to be there. I'd like to add here, <clears throat> uh, you know, going to a question. In fact, uh, today the marketing function spread is really widespread. You know, today there are multiple options. Uh, the overall function has also evolved a lot. And especially with the digital marketing coming in, there are multiple options, multiple avenues, multiple specialty roles, uh, non-specialty roles as well. So for a, uh, you know, for a person who has a two years experience in the customer-oriented role, my suggestion would be that person should take up a digital uh, certification course or a uh, you know, diploma course from a renowned institute. There are multiple institutes in fact, even Geo Institute would have uh, such, you know, a short, uh, short term uh, certificate course or a diploma course or even a graduate course uh, or a one year executive course. So once the person takes that, you know, it becomes easier for a person to switch, uh, you know, the role also, the function also, because it at least gives you the basics, basic understanding of the function, the role, uh, the nomenclatures that we use in marketing, you know, that, that would be quite different in different uh, functions. But in fact, uh, if a person is joining from a customer oriented role or a sales role, that would help a person to also bring in a different perspective, uh, a different value in the marketing role. You know, uh, that's my take on it. In fact, I do in my team also, in the marketing team also, the, the kind of spread that I have, I encourage people to switch role and add more uh, functionalities in their own role. So that is good for their own personal and professional growth. So they, they may, may be uh, in a span of six to 10 years of uh, work experience, but they get the exposure of various facets of marketing. You know, someone who is into social media, why can't they also get into the video making and vice versa. If somebody is also into event management, why can't the person also get into the video making? So I do encourage within my department also, and I'm sure today the corporates have evolved a lot. In fact, that's also becoming a part and parcel of the you know employee mental health that giving that opportunity, uh, encouraging the employees to, uh, you know, take up the roles, uh, more responsibilities, or uh, try out something new. So I'm sure that's very much uh, possible for a uh, you know, resource to move and switch the roles uh, within the organization or outside the organization as well. You know, fantastic. Fantastic. Actually, uh, uh, what you are saying, uh, also dovetails into some of the things that Kavita was saying uh, and Anusha. So, for example, if you do encourage people to take uh, different sorts of roles over a period of time, I think they will develop a more 360 degree kind of appreciation of this entire uh, game, uh, which then leads to probably better uh, customer empathy. Uh, I guess Kavita was driving at that when she said that you need the soft skills to think through like the customer uh, as well. And uh, Anusha, the three points that you mentioned, right? I was actually noting them down because uh, one of the things that I, I will do when students come in at Geo Institute would be to look after their careers. So, so 
absolutely brilliant points. I've actually noted down content, data, and then comes technology. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on to another question, and this is uh, more towards Anusha and Kavita from an agency perspective, because you deal with so many uh, customers you would have dealt over the years uh, and through this uh, transition of technology and uh, landscape. Uh, what changes have you seen in the way uh, your customers uh, approach their marketing uh, now? So uh, have you had to, as an agency, also evolve uh, with the juggernaut of social internet and uh, digital that we see? Uh, when I say how have customers changed? Are they uh, kind of redefining their marketing problems? Uh, are they looking at different touch points? Uh, of course, channels, uh, traditional versus online, that's another aspect. So if you could uh, both throw some light on that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Kavita, you want to go first? No, uh, I, I was, you were unmuted, so I waited. <laughs> so, no, so, so, you know, I, I just feel that uh, with the shift in the industry from, you know, digital marketing, it was considered a silo. I think what's happened in the last two years is very interesting. We are now marketing for a digital world, you know, and I think what clients or what uh, marketeers are increasingly now asking agencies, you know, because they themselves are scrambling with a number of business problems, you know, whether it's uh, related to slumping sales and, you know, getting them back on track or, or you know, issues with their supply chains or with talent, you know, to keep, uh, you know, Shafali talked about, you know, employees uh, and their mental health or, you know, dealing with that hybrid work culture and, you know, how to ensure that the culture of the organization doesn't kind of uh, vanish away. Now, I think our marketeers are, or our clients are really dealing with big issues right now. So what they want from their agency partners is somebody who takes care of all the uh, integration that's required. So earlier they were okay working with separate agencies and separate partners, one advertising company and another PR company, another digital company. And then they would break their head with each partner, invest time with each partner. But right now what they're continuously asking us is that, you know what, can you partner us uh, for a through the line uh, solution? which is going to help me really, uh, you know, which is impactful, which is a cost-effective solution and which allows me to reach my customers across touch points. I think that's uh, an ask I'm hearing continuously. I know that agencies earlier used to talk about integrated solutions, but right now that's coming as a very important ask uh, a lot from clients. They want it. And they will, they prefer to work with agencies that can offer that. And I think from an agency perspective, uh, the agency that's actually, you know, the agency of now and the future is going to be one that can rally uh, around the client's, client's business problem and have a best teams approach, you know, an integrated approach. Now, I know integration has been happening, a little bit of advertising, a little bit of digital marketing, but are we able to provide a solution which is across all customer touch points? I'm telling you, hands down, no agency can do it today, even now. It's, it's, a, it's an uphill task because integration itself is a very, you know, it requires talent. It requires talent which thinks alike, it thinks in a singular fashion, in a unified fashion. So that's, that's an opportunity for agencies. It's an opportunity for the talent. And I, I want to really talk about that because earlier agencies were really kind of, you know, looking at it in a very straight line approach, you know. Uh, the opportunity for talent is that now we are welcoming people who are data scientists. We are welcoming people who are AR uh, and, uh, you know, uh, VR specialists who are conversational uh, marketing specialists. You know, so we are looking to provide solutions which are beyond advertising, beyond PR, beyond uh, radio and TV, what we used to do earlier. The digital medium itself is a different ballgame to, uh, you know, altogether. So, for example, short videos. We look for a specialist who is a short video creator. And that's a new role that's coming, you know. And I think that's a huge opportunity for time out there. Um, you know, uh, the kind of education that they all are going to provide in the GEO Institute or any of the other educational institutes in the country. 
I think it's going to make all that difference, you know. And I would think the role of technology, the influx of data, importance of content, these are all things which are going to keep on changing. And I think the agency that's able to change fast enough, is able to uh, remain agile, is the one that's going to be able to work with its clients best, you know. And uh, our objective as agency partners is to really ensure that, you know, uh, like Anusha was talking earlier, you know, it may be a startup client which doesn't have big budgets, you know. So what do you do? I mean, the agency's role is to really ensure that we build uh, connections or we build relationships with the customer of that brand, uh, which allow it to capture mind space, uh, you know, share of wallet, and I would say heart space of the customer. So, yeah, that's that's what I'd like to say. I think Kavita covered most of it, actually. And uh, I'll just try and tell you a little story of how this whole evolution happened, just to kind of add to what she was saying, really. You know, in stage one, around, I'm talking about uh, uh, 2007, 2005, actually, you know, early stages of digital media that we kind of saw social media marketing. Uh, in stage one, uh, all clients, and, you know, she falls on the call and she can tell us if this happened with them, really. But uh, marketers went straight to their advertising agencies and requested them to manage digital marketing for them. Yeah, that was stage one. Really, because by default, advertising agencies were managing all the work and they said they know our brand, they know us extremely well. And, and these advertising agencies had started an in-house digital function and they said, okay, we can offer you digital solutions also. So clients went straight there. That was stage one in the early stages of 2006, 2007, I'm talking about. Then came stage two. Immediately, the clients realized, marketers realized these advertising agencies don't understand digital marketing. They're great with their... Uh, advertising and brand work, they don't understand uh, digital marketing. And they said, oh God, we cannot work with you. So they parted ways with the advertising agencies, right? And they went to what we call the independent digital marketing agencies. Normally, entrepreneur-run uh, agencies that started with two, three people and suddenly grew into being large digital agencies. Uh, and, and, and they went to these independent shops because these were entrepreneur-driven and therefore had the whole uh, uh, agility uh, to kind of, you know, really develop and build models around digital marketing and how digital marketing should function. I'm one of those founders of digital marketing and, you know, and I could see that, you know, I could see everybody flocking into digital marketing independent firms. Now, the third stage was what really we saw was that uh, mainline agencies saw that, you know, they were missing out on this whole business. Uh, you know, digital marketing was important. Uh, clients were going away, digital budgets were growing, they were going away to these independent jobs. Mainline agencies also realized that they cannot develop this in-house completely. So they needed to find a way to build, bring the specialization on board. They started to acquire these digital marketing agencies. Must tell you that the agency that I founded was acquired by the WPP group. And that's how I'm part of the great group right now. Really. Yeah. So they started to acquire because they believed that this was a strategic move. I can't build it in-house, so let me acquire a set of specialists who can come home and take care of this for me. So that was the third stage. Now we are in a stage called integration, like Kavita is calling, which is really they're saying that the consumer has converged. The consumer is one, right? It's the same consumer who's sitting and watching something on digital. It's the same consumer on the road watching a billboard. It's the same consumer watching TV. Sometimes it is the same consumer. The consumer is one. So the question really is, why should marketers feel the pain associated with multiple agencies, juggling multiple agencies for the same solution for one consumer? So now the, now's the time when, when the marketer is saying, you know what, I'm actually quite troubled, like uh, Chef Ali was saying. Within digital marketing itself, you can have somebody for data and insights. You can have somebody for online reputation management. You can have somebody running command centers. You can have e-commerce specialists. You can have various kinds of technologies and specialists. So, that it's, so if you start having so many agencies, it becomes so complicated that you're not able to do your business really well. So now the market here is saying, hey, you know what? Now is the time. You know, now they know even advertising agencies and digital agencies have come together. Now they're saying, hey, can you reduce my pain point? Give me integrated solutions, right? And this is really where the world is moving just now. And like Kavita said, it's a far-fetched dream. Uh, but lots of us are trying. 
uh, networks like us, for example, you know, I belong to a network called the WPP network, has at least some 40 agencies under the umbrella, right? Now we're saying that even if we can't do everything within our agency, within the network, can we reach out to each other and get work done? Right? I can have some kind of a Adobe tech solution from another agency. I could be great with online reputation management. Somebody else could be great with Salesforce. So can I come together as a network and give the solution? And that's the kind of talk that's happening really in the world today. But integrated solutions is really where we are heading. Uh, and integrated is again very complex. What integration means can be very different to different uh, companies, that's where it's heading. Fantastic, fantastic observations. In fact, I would like to add a line to this from the brand perspective. Uh, I would say both the ladies have really articulated it very well. In fact, Anusha, I can actually, uh, you know, it was for me a walkthrough that you explained that stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four is what today is. Uh, definitely, we have been on, I have been always on the, this side of the fence and I've seen this, been a part of that, you know, conversations with the agencies, uh, you know, mainline agencies, digital agencies, and digital agencies in the second stage, uh, rather were more of the website agencies. They, they had more of Forte managing the website and that's how uh, further we, we had these expertise growing. Uh, just one uh, you know, sub point submission from the brand perspective, I would say today, what we see is that uh, the, the lines, the LOC is re really blurring between the PR agency or the social media agency and the mainline agency as well. So whenever we have a brief, you know, as a client, we have a product launch brief, everyone would, everyone would come up with a 360 degree approach. So my PR agency would also come and talk about influencers. And, you know, uh, so, so I would say it's a wonderful uh, world now <laughs> that everybody is thinking on all lines. Every agency, even if my PR agency or a social media agency, they would also think beyond the social media platform. So I think this is a wonderful period that we are into, at least from the brand perspective. More options for the brand. But I guess at some point it also needs to kind of clean up, right? Because we're all overlapping with each other, doing everybody's work, making life more complex for ourselves, yeah. for the client. I'm sure we're waiting for the stage five, Anusha. <laughs> yeah, where we kind of, you know, have very clear demarcation of these. Again, it, it might split on, split on further. Again, maybe. True. That actually leads me to the next question that I had in mind for all three of you. What lies ahead? Uh, you mentioned stage five, so probably you can delve a little more in terms of what changes do you anticipate uh, in this particular field? Is digital the new traditional? Would traditional go away? Uh, things like TV and print, you know. Uh, if so, then as a marketing professional, how do you prepare for it? I can take I, that first. Sorry, what is that? Sorry, sorry. Atushta, you want to take that? Yeah, happy. Uh, I don't think TV will go away. Uh, you know, I mean, 1.3 billion people. Uh, TV has a place in, in human hearts, at least for the next many years that I can foresee it right now. Uh, will digital grow even bigger and explode even more? It will. There is no doubt about it. Uh, print will shrink. It will never go away. You will still need print for something or the other, right? Uh, these businesses will shrink. I don't think they will go away. I can see uh, 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 a lot more options. Uh, in digital, whoever thought that OTT as a platform would be so beautiful and, you know, literally all our lives would revolve around these many different platforms going around. Whoever thought that, you know, a phone could pay uh, bills. Whoever thought a phone is where you would spend all your time so much, right? You only did calls and messages in the past. I'm just saying digital is definitely going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm not seeing the end of TV just now. Uh, I'm not seeing the end of print. I do see a shrinking print. I don't see an end of TV. TV will still continue to play uh, a, a big role. Even now, right, you can see a lot more homes who have decided to move the phone and the content on the phone into a TV, right? That's what TV is getting used for. Um, I think TV will have its place uh, for a while. Uh, it will not go away because there are too many marketeers who also still believe in TV. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the next 40, 50 years and maybe things will change then. But in the next 10 years to come, TV will stay. Digital will explode. I, I don't even know what will come next on the plate visually. I think it's very important to kind of recognize every change uh, and change with it, uh, but it will explode. Shefali. I, yes, I, I do agree with Anusha, digital definitely. So digital marketing, I would say, uh, has been the biggest uh, catalyst 
to you know change the marketing perspective and uh, make this function more widespread you know being a part of the corporate strategy also so today even the digital the spence of the digital digital is also a part of the uh, the corporate strategy in fact uh, uh, today with the digital we we have this equal pie or uh, you know depending on the brands the, it depends what how much share of the pie do we have but there is a divide in the marketing spends you know even whether it's a performance marketing or not but today when i manage the brand i do have my budgets for uh, social media promotion as well so of course digital will be there and i would partly say yes digital is the new tradition but at the same time as anusha said uh, traditional marketing will not go away for sure and uh, in fact i'll cite an example my own example i have been into insurance industry for last 20 to 30 years so insurance largely is driven by you know channel distributors and the digital assets now at least since last 5 to 6 uh, years the digital assets have also become more important for a sales touch point perspective so from these two perspective uh, we do have to keep a balance between the the three facets of the marketing because there is a lot of scope from the channel distributor perspective so i do have my budgets and a special team managing the btl activities uh, i would say on ground activities that's a, a forte also so i do have to strike a balance between the spends on digital btl and atl but uh, this will uh, continue for long i would i'm sure that this will continue and uh, in fact digital definitely i agree with anusha that there is much more that will come in our way in terms of the martech and uh, more more of the innovations in the uh, digital platforms uh, however um, offlet the buzzword is the uh, metaverse and in india also we are uh, slowly but steadily growing in that direction last week only we were discussing my team was discussing with me there was a proposal to do a sponsorship event a holy event on metaverse so it was quite interesting to you know explore nice. but uh, yeah a lot to come and i am looking forward for more digital uh, innovations that's great uh, so i have been kind of bring in a couple of these questions from the audience uh, side as well uh, i'll just take we are running short of time it's been such an engrossing uh, discussion uh, i'll just probably take one or two questions which i thought from the audience are really nice uh, Janak is asking um, respect panel members what would you say are the biggest gaps between education in brand communication and experience and agencies needs in the coming future sorry if i rightly understand uh, the question is education but the the uh, institute parting uh, that education about the brand form and what is required in the market expectation from the agency so uh, uh, the person mentioned agency the road, so i would say actually it's both ways what is required in the field versus is are there gaps in what is being taught um i think the gap is just that uh, you know uh, one has to take a leap uh, largely the learning is always uh, you know at work Uh, that that's how uh, the learning comes the real learning comes while the education and the institutes would definitely give your uh, you know uh, the foundation more strength uh, you'll be well versed that how the uh, you know communication can be built what are the uh, best ways to do it like in the digital certification courses also like i have done a digital course because i wanted to be you know uh, uh, upgraded with the the latest trends that are coming up so at least today i have that basic knowledge and while working uh, in that field of performance marketing or a social media promotion i got that uh, you know edge on it but at least with the knowledge the the educate educative knowledge that i have i know what means what and what are the nomenclatures yeah i would tend to agree with you pali you know uh, educational institutes uh, i think try their best to uh, allow uh, students or individuals you know budding professionals to understand what's the landscape looking like what are your opportunities there but you know uh, finally when you come into the workplace you know and also at that point when students are really trying to explore you know they themselves are trying to see what what they would gravitate towards so i don't think there's any need gap so to say but because the technology and because the economy itself is changing so fast you know things are changing so fast sometimes i think it's important for students or professionals who are enrolling for courses 
to uh, have a parallel track you know while they are studying at the institution it's also important for them to uh, like i said follow the general trends of that industry also start forming some sort of an opinion on which direction you want to go in and hence build that you know start talking to industry professionals attend panel discussions like these to get a better understanding of where you want to finally you know steer your career and uh, you know like we've all heard about metaverse yeah uh, we've heard about it but the real feeling will come only when you have experiential understanding so institutes provide you a broad fundamentals and everything that will equip you to go forward in your career but finally you will decide you know what way you're going to steer your career only when you enter the workplace and maybe you know two three years down your career not even at the outset you know so thanks a lot so we have just completed an hour but i'll take a minute because i have a interesting question and any of you can take a quick stab at it so priyanka is asking how would marketers think about brand positioning in tier 1 or 2 uh, smaller towns where consumers may not always have access to smartphones she says especially rural women for example what should be the parameters when deciding an ideal marketing mix today in that light how do you go about that question uh, priyanka you will be shocked to know the fastest growing market on the internet today is the rural market and women as a gender is the fastest growing gender uh, it is a myth to believe that rural market is not on the internet and is not growing as far as digital penetration is concerned uh, you will be shocked and it is a myth so don't believe it india has internet everywhere thanks to jio i think uh, who better than our three panelists to answer that question on women incidentally we have all three of you on the panel uh so uh, with that uh, i would like to uh, kind of end today's session uh, it's been a a very very enriching experience i have certainly enjoyed uh, all the insights that you have provided uh, i hope that uh, our audience also uh, have been able to take away some solid points in terms of how do they integrate whether they are a, a customer of this digital or a provider or a professional uh, hope they have been able to take some pointers that they could really use in their real life um, would also like to thank dr frank mulhan as well for his uh, opening remarks so with that uh, i uh, close the session uh, for today uh, wish you all a very happy holi and have a good evening ahead thanks everyone thank you happy holi thank you thank you thank, thank you shavita thank you shefali pleasure being with you here today pleasure bye bye thank you dr frank yes bye 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 bye